Hello and welcome back to the NSA Codebreaker Challenge with the final task 7. So far we've been methodically pulling apart the Terra Time organization, however we have not been able to actually read the encrypted messages for the users. If you haven't guessed, this entire challenge is designed to teach you about the RSA encryption scheme and public key cryptography in general. Each of the users has a 2048-bit RSA key pair that they use to encrypt and decrypt the messages that they send, and so you'll find that it's quite unbreakable under normal circumstances. In this case, though, we've been informed that the terrorist arrested in Task 3 is in fact the developer for the organization who created the encryption scheme that they're using, and he's hidden a subtle vulnerability in the program as insurance. Before I continue, if you aren't familiar with how public key cryptography works, then I recommend watching the video link in the description. The channel Art of the Problem has a great analogy that helps to explain some of the concepts that we're relying on when developing an exploit for this task. If you've primed yourself on the underlying concepts behind RSA encryption, then you'll know that the modulus of a public key is the product of two large prime integers, traditionally referred to as P and Q. In a public key of any decent size, it's considered to be computationally difficult to factor a modulus and obtain its prime factors. This means that RSA keys over a certain bit length are considered to be safe for encrypting messages because they can't easily be broken even with the fastest computers. So in order to recover the private key for our TerraTime user and be able to decrypt their messages, we would somehow have to be able to recover the prime factors used in the public key for that user. This gives us an idea of where we need to start when reverse engineering the provided keygen executable. I won't bore you too much with the reverse engineering part because this video will be focused more on developing the exploits needed to decrypt the messages. However, I will give a quick overview of my own process for you to understand how this task was completed. First, we need to download the keygen executable from the task 7 page and open it up in your debugger of choice. I personally use the free version of IDA because the graph view is very useful for understanding the flow of the program. Again, I'm not going to bore you too much with all the reverse engineering step by step, but I do have a video link in the comments where I break it down a little more in depth. For now, what you need to know is that each copy of this executable contains several strings that are hard coded. These strings are a public key in PIM format and two base64 strings. And there are a set of these strings for each of the available key sizes, 512, 1024, and 2048, so six in total. You can easily extract them by opening the executable file and searching for the dashes at the beginning of the first public key. When the program is launched, it looks at the key size that was requested in the command arguments, or 2048 by default, and then loads the strings that correspond with that size of key. The public key is loaded from the PIM format, and then both of the base64 strings are converted to large integers, which we will call R1 and R2. These are important because they are used in the keygen process and are vital to reversing that process to obtain the private key for a user. After a ton of step-by-step -step analysis of this executable, I was able to determine that this is the algorithm that is used to generate keys using a sort of clever encryption scheme. It's nigh impossible to crack were it not for the fact the developer made it possible to brute force the public keys if you recognize the mathematical weakness here. Let's look at it step by step. First, a large prime number is generated that is half the bit length of the key that was requested. So for a 2048 bit key, it will generate a 1024 bit prime number. Now instead of simply generating a second prime factor, the program calls an XOR function with the prime, which we'll call P, and the R1 number. Next, it looks to see if the output value is greater than the value of the public key modulus. If not, then it adds 1 to R1 and then tries the XOR again. This repeats up to 10 times, after which it calls a function called permute R keys, which hashes R1 with a hash function depending on its bit length. Once a suitable value for the XOR function is found, it continues to RSA encrypt that number using the public key. Then it performs a second XOR using the R2 key. 
Finally, the program generates random bytes equal to the size of the XOR output and appends them to the end, creating a number that is double end bit length as the previous one. Now here's where things get rather interesting. In the next step, the function divides P from this large number, which we'll call X, and gets a new number Q. If Q is a prime number, then it continues to build the public and private keys from P and Q and outputs them to the user. Otherwise, it adds one to R2 and loops around again up to a thousand times. Anyone who is observant will notice that there's a bit of math here that's pretty cool. If X divided by P equals Q, then P times Q equals X, the modulus of the outputted public key. This means that every public key in the TerraTime organization is actually just an obfuscated form of the prime factor P with some random bytes appended to the end to make each one unique. With this knowledge in mind, we're then able to deduce a simple method for reversing the key generation process and obtaining that original prime factor. Then the entire encryption scheme unravels. This chart demonstrates that reversal process. Starting with any public key from a TerraTime user, we take the upper half of the modulus and XOR them with R2, since we're working in reverse. Then, decrypt the output using the private key of the public key that is in the program. Then, XOR that with R1, and that output gives us a candidate for P to try. We can simply test if the public key mod P equals zero, and if it does, then we divide P to get Q and we're done. Otherwise, we increment R1 and R2 using a similar scheme as the creation process and try again. In my experience, most keys are cracked within a few hundred iterations. But wait a second, let's back up to this decryption part. If a 1024-bit public key is used in the creation of a 2048-bit key pair, then how can we do this decryption step unless we can somehow crack a 1024-bit public key? This is where it gets really fun and clever codebreakers can see the pattern here. If a public key of half the size is used to create the next level up, and the program contains three public keys of increasing size, then what if this same process was used to create them all? For example, a 256-bit key is used to create the 512-bit key, then that one is used to create the 1024-bit key, and then finally that one is used to create the 2048-bit key that's used by the TerraTime user. That means if we start at the bottom, we just need to crack each one of these keys in sequence. As it turns out, this reduces the difficulty of the problem substantially, because the only key that we actually need to try to factor ourselves is the 256-bit key at the bottom of the chain. For this, we can use a free program called Yafu, which is able to perform the factoring in about 3 to 5 minutes, and give us back the two 128-bit factors. Now we need to actually build something to perform the cracking process. I'll walk you through a Python program that I created to do just that, and you can download the script from GitHub at the link in the description. I started by creating a class called KeyRecover, which accepts all of the values that are extracted from the program, and then a function called Recover, which accepts a target public key. As you can see, this function performs the brute forcing process that I laid out in the previous diagram on the given public key. If a candidate value for P is found to be evenly divisible from the target key, then it returns the factors as well as the private key. After completing that part, we need to actually set it up to run the chaining process on each of the public keys in the executable. For ease of use, I included some simple parsing in the script to automatically open the executable in the same folder and extract the necessary values to continue. The only thing that it can't do is factor the smallest 256-bit public key. However, we can just plug in the values here that we obtained from the Yafu factoring program. When we run this script, it will run the recovery process on the 512-bit public key and return the private key for it. Then it will take that private key and use it to crack the 1024-bit public key. Now down here, the script loads the file target.key which contains the public key for the TerraTime user, and it repeats the recovery process and outputs the private key for it as well. 
Now, unfortunately, even though we know the private key at this point, we can't actually just go and copy it into the app and log in. There's actually an extra step in the process. If you look at the client DB file from task three, you'll see that the public key is in plain text, while the private key appears to be encoded in some way where you're not able to read it. If you take the time to decompile the original source code from the TerraTime APK, then you can see how it's handled. In the file client.java, there's a function called encrypt client bytes that is used to encrypt whatever values are given to it. It uses pbkdf2, which stands for password-based key derivation function, to create a 256-bit AES password based on the user's six-digit pin, and then uses that password to encrypt the original input and save it to the database. So knowing this, I was able to create the same process in my Python script, so the final RSA private key in PIM format can be encrypted using the PIN code from task 4. And finally, just for ease of use, I have the script automatically patch the client DB file with the username of the target, their public key, and their encrypted private key. So let's go ahead and run the script and you can see how this works. If everything runs successfully, then we can go ahead and start up our emulator and upload the patched client DB. Now at this point, we're logging into the organization leader like we did in task 4 with the cell leader, except now we have their public and private key in the client DB, and so the app is able to decrypt all of their messages. Now we're in the final stretch to completing this task. We simply need to look through these conversations and find the information we need to turn in. You'll notice that the location of the action will actually be a little hard to find, and that's because it's in another user's conversations. You'll see that one of the cell leaders mentions their clan is ready to carry out the action, however they don't really say exactly where. So if you repeat this cracking process again for that user, you can log into their account and you'll see the exact location in a conversation with one of their underlings. Now we're ready to go ahead and submit everything. And we're finally done. I hope that this video series was helpful and you learned a lot along the way. If you weren't able to complete all of the challenges on your own this year, then definitely keep learning and you'll be prepared to take on the NSA Codebreaker Challenge of 2020. All of the scripts and tools mentioned in these videos will be available on my GitHub at the link in the description for you to look and try out for yourself. Once again, thank you for watching and see you next year.